Okay, wave your Bibles in the air like you really do care. Hola, <laughs> yeah. I want to see that. Oh, Lola, the phone. As long as it's got the sound of pages turning, I'm right there. Come on. Don't tell me you've all substituted your Bibles. There you go. Oh, Danielle. There you go. There you go. There you go. One, one real I see it. This is like a concert there, Ruben. Like the way you're moving your phone in the sky. Like, come on, baby. <laughs> All right, turn with me to Acts chapter 14. We are starting or resuming our series of the book of Acts. Last year we preached on the book of Acts from chapter 1 through 13, and it was great. And we are, I would say, resurrecting the series, but we are resuming the series, and we're going to be looking from verse from chapter 14 through to about chapter 20 to 21 in this next uh, portion of the series. The book of Acts is a great. It's an easy book to read. It's not like some of Paul's letters where you say, Paul, come on, put some punctuation in somewhere would be great. You know, we have to use six line sentences. Not always the easiest to follow. It's not a, it's not a prophetic book which could be compact. It's a story full of drama and excitement. It's easy to read. And what it, what it does, the book of Acts covers the story of the birth of the church. Is this going to irritate people if I have a little crackle? It's atmospheric, atmospheric, I think. Um, it's, uh, the book of Acts covers the first 30 or 32 years of the church. And um, what Luke does in this, uh, the author of the book of Acts, he compresses the story into just 28 chapters. And the one side of that is he misses out all the boring stuff. Well, like all the, the, the mundane faithfulness the awkwardness and the ordinariness of church. So you can sometimes read the book of Acts think, oh, it was just excitement for one minute, but it wasn't. There was lots of ordinariness in it as well. But the way that Luke does it means that it is an exciting ride which lifts our heads. And the book of Acts is meant to lift our heads. Here's how God takes this ragtag bunch of confused believers in an upper room and he works through them to build his church into an empire, which is the most powerful empire of the time, one of the most powerful empires ever, and, he, and, and hostile to the gospel. He takes, he builds his church with, with people you would, you would marginalize and never think would be any good, and he takes it and he builds his church, and the Roman Empire collapses and ends, and other empires rise and fall. But this church continues. And here we are in 2023 in the UK, worshiping God, and thousands of miles away from where Jesus was crucified, all over the world, people are worshiping and glorifying God because nothing can stop the gospel, Amen. and nothing can destroy His church. Even with our scars and our failures and our mess-ups, it is indestructible because it is held by Him. Yes. Amen. And there we go. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Come on. Yes. Getting better yes. gospel at time. Hallelujah. And we should read the book of Acts and say, you know what? What God did then, He can do now. Because we are the same church with the same Holy Spirit inside of us, so it should lift our heads. Mm. Now, when I started this series last year, I mentioned three things. And I want you to consider these three things as we read through the passage today. <coughs> the first thing I said was that the book of Acts is a story of what Jesus continues to do through His Spirit in the church. It's a continuing story of Jesus through us. Wherever the churches where Jesus worshipped and glorified, that's where Jesus is. Secondly, the power of the Holy Spirit is linked to the advancement of God's kingdom. If we want to see God's power, are we about God's business? Sometimes in charismatic circles we want smushy, smushy feelings. And sometimes by God's grace, He pours it out upon us at different times. But if we really want to see the power of God, we need to step up beyond our boundaries. Because if we see the book of Acts, His power comes down to testify to the gospel that we preach to turn people's hearts. Amen. Thirdly, we see in the book of Acts that the church is called to be outward focused. To be the church is to be on mission and engaging with the world around us. So when we look at Acts chapter 14, it's uh, in Acts chapter 13 where we left off previously, what we had read was that Paul and Barnabas had been set apart by the Holy Spirit to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And we're going to read 
from X or T, and I'm going to find my glasses, otherwise I'm going to start reading in sums, um, because I can't read at all. That's a classic. I knew something. I said, well, I started reading using my reading glasses before I needed it. Thank God that they're in there. Yeah, absolutely. The bright green box, so I couldn't miss it. Okay. Right, here we go. Now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. Isn't that amazing? Daniel? Yes. Exactly. Yes. Right across the street. They yeah, exactly. preached the gospel and both Jews and Greeks believed. Mm. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord who bore witness to the word of His grace granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So there we go. As they preach the word of God boldly, the Lord bears witness to the word he's preaching with signs and wonders. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derb, cities in Lycania and Lopania, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Now, Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking. And Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet, O Lord. May you look at us and see that we have faith. For your, for your power, for your healing, for your move, that everyone to do it. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lycaonian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, and wanted to offer sacrifices with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out of the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did not... For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifices to them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. I find that like this. You know the contrast there. Like at one moment, we are going to worship you. I mean, you cannot think more of someone than you want to worship them. But someone comes along and sways them, the next one they're stoning them. And it says they left him for dead. So they must have looked at Paul and said, I think he's dead. Do you think he's dead? I think he's dead. Or are we going to, you think he's dead? We're going to leave him. So he looked pretty dead. He looked pretty damaged. He walks away, and then Paul gets up. And he stands up and he goes back into the city. That's a miracle. He rose up and entered the city. When the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to do it. Just a pause there. One of the things that strikes me with this is we've got to be very careful as the church and all we do not to place the crowd. The crowd is fickle. One day it will worship you. One day it will stone you. Where we, the, we, we exist for the audience of one. Our, is what we're doing to the glory of His name? Are we satisfying what He wants? Because if we do it, for, if we do it to try and make ourselves popular, we find ourselves in a very, very dangerous place. Worship and then stone. When they preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations 
we must enter the kingdom of God. One of the things that you, you realize as you read through the book of Acts, specifically through Acts chapter 14, is that to be a Christian is to be in a battle. To be a Christian is to find yourself in places of opposition because inside of us, we carry the kingdom of God, which is contrary to the zeitgeist of this age or the spirit of this age. It's, it's different to the passions, the preferences, the, the ways, the thoughts of the world around us. And therefore, we will always, at some stage, find ourselves in conflict. And if we go through, if we should never be surprised. If Jesus says, if they hate me, they'll hate you. We should never be surprised if we find ourselves in persecution and on the wrong side of comments and thoughts and opposition. In fact, if we never do, I think there is something wrong. Or we have maybe softened our passion for Jesus and his words. And when they appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word of Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them. And how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles, and there remained no little time with the disciples. I love that chapter. Full of excitement, full of adventure, preaching, miracles, stonings, um, the whole bunch you'd imagine sitting in that church in Antioch and hearing Paul and Barnabas unpack, and then this happened, and then that happened. But I want to pick up on something. There's a lot to you could be said in this particular chapter, but I just want to pick up on one or two things specifically. Something that you may have missed as you read that chapter. In verses 21 to 22, it says, When they had preached the gospel to that city that had been Derb, and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch to strengthen the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. Now, if you look at a map, once they left the city of Derb, there was a much quicker route to go home. There was a much quicker, easier route to go back from Derb to Antioch, where they had started. But they don't choose to go the easy route. They retrace their steps through the places where they were stoned, where they were abused, where they were left for dead. Paul, I think, imagine Paul going back to those cities and see where his blood was spilled as he was stoned. He chooses and Barnabas choose not only to go inconveniently the long way back, but also to go the dangerous way back to strengthen the saints. And one of the things that strikes me about that is just how much Paul and Barnabas must have loved these local churches that have been planted. How he must have seen the incredible value and the importance of these local churches. And we see something of this in all of Paul's writings. His love for the churches. We see it in John's writing and Peter's writing. The love that he has for these churches. And when I think of these churches that were planted in, in Lystra and Iconium and Durban, I don't know if you've ever done this. I mean, I like to use my imagination. And I think to myself, what would it be like to be in those first churches? I think one of the things is it would be very messy. It would be, it would be messy. You had, um, you know, it wouldn't have been in those churches, you know what, about 40, about 80% of the churches has already had a strong Christian tradition, um, knows how to tithe, when to stand up and, and worship, um, you know, how to do coffee afterwards and before, or what a connect group is. No, no, you've got 100% unchurched people. 100% of people who, who don't have a clue about what it means to be church. Bring in the culture that they had. Then you've got the clash of culture between Jew and Gentile, which was yeah. oil and water, coming together into the same context. Then you've got them trying to work out doctrine. They weren't saved and got a book on systematic theology. They were trying to work out what is the Trinity? What is the incarnation? What does this mean? That I think it was quite messy. But I also think it was a place of incredible power. There were communities that had been birthed in the presence and seeing God's Holy Spirit move and heal and do miracles. 
I think there was an expectation that they had of the realness and the real presence of God in their space. Messy, complicated churches full of the power of God and a ready expectation of them to be present. I think as well that they were unambiguous places. See, we don't understand how in that era how integrated religion was to life. If you had to say, well, I'm actually leaving worshipping these four idols, whatever they are, and I'm going to become a Christian, you weren't just saying, yeah, I'm going to go to that, that place on Sunday. What you were saying goodbye to was your family, your work, your political influence. It was a complete break with everything that you were part of. Because your faith and your religion was completely integrated to what it meant to be alive in those places. And so, you didn't make that choice lightly. You just think, oh, you know what? I'm going to try this Christian thing. Because if you did that, you were opening yourself up to persecution and ostracization. So everybody was there. They were there. There was no kind of a, what should I word, spectators within those churches. They are all made an incredible sacrifice. They all looked at their lives and the comfort of their lives, everything they had, and said, you know what? This Jesus is bigger and better than everything I have. And sometimes when I find myself in places where I, I've come across or been with people from different cultures, for whom this is still the case, I am sober. There is a lady um, I used to work with in when I used to work at the bank, she was, a, uh, she was an Indian lady, and she came to, she started dating this um, Christian guy, um, and came to faith, and she became a Christian. But her coming to faith meant she lost connection with her family, she was ostracized by everybody, um, and it had a massive implication on her life. I thought to myself, if anybody doubts the reality of Jesus, who would do this? Mm. When I go through to Sri Lanka, and I see the people who turn away from, from Hinduism or from Buddhism and turn to follow Jesus and all the implications that means. Who would do that if Jesus wasn't real for them? Yeah. I spoke this morning about a man who was part of our church, Ashwam. And I, we mentioned before, he was a, a man, a, a guy from Afghanistan who came to faith and then he came to our church and was going to get baptized. And when he was getting baptized, he was trembling as he was going to the to be baptized because he knew the implications. This wasn't just some kind of fair thing, you know, I just went a new club. No, no, he understood what was taking place. He understood the sacrifice of what was going to happen. And so when he came to faith, he was baptized, he decided to go back to Afghanistan, try to share his faith with his father. His father beat him up so badly um, that um, when he eventually escaped from the situation in Afghanistan, and he, he was, he was helped, some of the people helped him to escape. And when he escaped and he got to Dubai, they couldn't recognize him on his passport because he'd been so brutally beaten. And when he came back here, he still held no ill will towards his father and loved his father. He was right to tremble. Yeah. He was right to tremble when he got to that, that um, baptismal pool. Because there is something significant that takes place. Mm. I don't think that this is church. These churches were messy. These churches, churches were full of power. But these churches, there was an unambiguous nature of what they had done. I also think that these churches as well, were the, well they were the only show in town. And, um, you know, I think Paul was what Paul said earlier tonight when we were praying for Samuel. I think it's right. We will find, in any environment, you will find that you will see people will move from, you know, like Samuel, he moved, he's investing and, and giving so much to this church, and then he'll be moving to our Oasis church, and that's wonderful. And uh, you see those kinds of things happen. But I want to emphasize this, this side of the equation. In this time, there was one show in town. That means, if you got hacked off in your church, you couldn't go down the road to the other church. I'm going to the other church because people have your. Well, I'm not getting opportunities. Well, this is what happens. I'm, no, you're forced to engage with all your. dot, dot, dot. With other people. 
You have to work it out because there's no other church down the road. And there is something vitally important of being able to be put into a place where you cannot move and where you're forced to deal with yourself. That is how you grow. That is how we become community. That's what they were, I think, was so clear here. There was the only show in town with these churches. And you saw how emotional you know, uh, Samuel was in the evening tonight. You shouldn't join a church like me. You should never leave a church like me. It should grip you. It should stir your heart. Too often I see situations. Someone comes in and then they, you know, they go and I'm going to another church. I thought, you have no idea. You have no concept of what it means to belong to a family. And all the messiness that goes with it. So what we see in Acts chapter 14 is we see something which happens throughout the New Testament and has been happening throughout history. They preach the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ. This is not a self-help program. It's not a new moral code. But it's a declaration of the extraordinary news of what the creator of heaven and earth, the only true God, what he has done for us through Jesus Christ. How God has burst into our world, has reconciled us back to himself by dealing with our sin on the cross and has ushered in his perfect kingdom. A kingdom which you carry if you have the Holy Spirit inside of you and which we participate in for eternity. A kingdom of justice and a kingdom of love. And they preach this. And once they preach it, they then plant churches. And just as was the case, this is the case now, these groups of Jesus believers, like here in Kingsgate Church, were vital. Why are they vital? First of all, because they encouraged and sustained the new converts. These communities were vital to encourage disciples in the midst of persecution and incredible pressure in the world that they found themselves. Without the community, without those moments when they gathered together to break bread, to worship, to read Paul's letters that were written, to go through the scriptures, they wouldn't have lasted. They wouldn't have lasted or kept a distance. And you know what? It's the same for you. You will not last the distance. You will not keep walking the faith on your own. And what the devil does, our enemy, what he wants to do is he wants to isolate you. And he's continually trying to remove and separate you from fellowship. He reminds you of your shame. And he'll remind you of your sins. And he'll remind you of your rubbish and say, surely you cannot be a hypocrite. And this, you've done that so many times. How can you expect to come back? Don't be a hypocrite. That is the enemy speaking to you. Or oh, he'll pick an offense. And we'll get upset with someone. You don't understand how offended I am. Or upset I was. And then what we do is that we, we pull away. That's the enemy playing on card trick on you again. He'll make you busy in business. But whatever he'll do is he will try to keep you away from the community. Because like a lion separates an antelope, he's trying to separate you from the herd so that he can devour you. We need each other. They, these small communities, these local churches, were vital to encourage and sustain converts. But secondly, they were essential for the new converts to practice becoming their destiny. Let me explain this to you. To be a Christian at a very fundamental level is to become part of a new community, to become part of a new family. To become part of a body that works together to demonstrate Jesus. A community that's marked by love and grace and increasingly by God's grace begins to smell and look a little bit more like Jesus. Unfortunately, in the Western world, we see everything through an individual lens. So what we do is we see our salvation in an individual way. I am saved. My, my, my sins are forgiven. I'm saved. Happy days. And we find our identity by looking at ourselves as an individual. I am key, whatever, whatever. But that's not how Paul would have looked at it. That's not how anybody would have looked at it to whom Paul was speaking and Paul was writing. 
They would have looked at the corporate element first before looking at the individual. They would have said, what have you become part of? That defines who you are. And that's where you get your individual identity from. I am part of the body of Christ. I've become part of this family. I've become part of a priesthood of, 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 of believers. That defines who I am. It starts from the corporate coming to the individual. Our destiny is not ultimately an individual destiny, but it's a corporate destiny. And that's why when we are, when, when we are saved, we become part of this new body, Christ's body. And this is such a big deal to Paul. Ephesians is a fantastic book. But we read Ephesians very often in an individual way. What does this mean for me? That's not what Paul's doing. He's celebrating the church. That's why he says, So when you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Ephesians chapter 2, 19. What Paul is saying to the Gentiles in that context, he's saying, you know, you weren't part of it. You weren't part of the family. You weren't part of this new story. But by God's grace, he's included you into his plan, into his story. You are blessed. Therefore, being part of a local church enables us to come face to face with our identity. Being part of a local church reminds us that we are part of a story which is much bigger than us. Much bigger than who we are. Much bigger than our dreams. Much bigger than our individual worries or anything. And thirdly, it's a place to practice love, grace, and forgiveness, and the gospel on one another. God is not surprised and disappointed that churches are made up of imperfect people who hurt one another, say the wrong things, frustrate each other at times. He's not surprised, he's not frustrated, he's not disappointed by any of those things. Because it is in real, flawed, broken communities that we get the best opportunities to practice the gospel. Here is my request, and it's part of what I said earlier. Don't ever run away, guys. Whether you're embedded in this church, or embedded in another church somewhere down the line, don't run away. Conf rather have healthy, spiritual confrontations in love when you get to the bottom of things, rather than running around and repeating the same mistake and the same battle a thousand different places. To be a Christian and to avoid being part of a church. Let me just say, we can avoid, we can pitch up to church every Sunday and still avoid being part of a local church. Mm. Because it's not about walking through the door, it's about our hearts in the moment. It's about our hearts of attachment. It's about how we integrate with one another. How we learn to love one another and be known and allow ourselves to be known. But to be a Christian and to avoid being part of a church, it's akin to saying this, I have decided to play football. So I've signed up for a football club and I've bought the kit, but I'm not going to join the team. I'm just going to sit in my back garden and kick the ball against the wall. Quite clearly, you're not playing football. No matter how many keepy uppies you can do or how many balls you can knock on your head, you can convince yourself, you can say what you like, but football is a team sport. And kicking a ball against the wall in the back garden is not football. It's the same with church. Church is a team sport. Church is a together moment. You cannot do it on your own. Third thing, these churches are vital not only because they encourage and secure the church in its journey, not only because it helps us to practice our destiny, but thirdly, because it's a place where the kingdom of God is grounded in those cities. I was thinking about this when I was in the Drakensburg. It was the last time I was in the Drakensburg, I was trying to, with my, me and my mates were trying to pitch a tent in the wind. It was not a happy moment. Um, and it reminded me that if you want to pitch a tent, what you need to do is you need to put the, the pegs into the ground. And you tie the tent around those pegs to secure it. And that's what happens. 
is every local church is an opportunity for the kingdom of God to be secured in a particular place. If any of you see YouTube, you may have seen a very famous preacher. I was going to talk about pitching tents. And so whenever the little pastor uses those words, there's a slight sweaty palm in his hand as he says that. But um, go up and watch the YouTube clip of Bike Bunny. So. What's the name? Can you say the name? Uh, I'm not going to say the name. Okay, okay. <laughs> so just, just search Canadian Youth Pastor. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Um, but local churches matter. That's why we've planted five churches in the life of this church. It's why we are part of the Genesis Collective and planting churches and wanting to plant churches and supporting churches around the world. It's why Paul and I are going to Ireland in this month to support churches in that place. It's why I do what I do. It's why we do what we do. Because local church matters. With all its scars, with all its frailties and its weaknesses. What we see, though, in the, in the book of in the, in Acts chapter 14, and what we see throughout the New Testament, throughout history, gospels preached, church are planted, and it says leaders are appointed. In Acts 14, in verse 23, it says, And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, so as they retrace their steps through the the, the danger where they'd been stoned, where they'd been beaten, where they'd been abused. They went to these little communities and through the power of the Spirit, through prayer and fasting, they appointed leaders in each of these churches. Because if any church is going to be healthy, if any church is going to be a place where believers thrive, if any church is going to be a place where the kingdom is grounded in the city, it needs leaders. We need leaders. And I know this verse is particularly talking about eldership and they appointed elders in each of the cities, but I want to take the liberty of being more general and just talking about leadership in general. And you know, church leadership is an emotive topic. It's an emotive topic because on one hand, we have seen, and it's always publicized, the negative examples and the failures of church leaders. And I want to say something to you, for every negative story of a church leader, there are thousands and thousands of ordinary, under the radar, faithful leaders in the power of God, loving people, loving churches. But still, we see those publicized versions. And we also find, many of us may have found ourselves in the situations where we've been hurt by leadership styles, and that can almost make us skeptic and nervous about leadership. Secondly, in a deconstructionist world, there's much talk about actually, do we need leaders? You know, we just need to meet in the pub with Zoom and my mate in Canada and over a burger, and that's where church is. No, it's not. No, that's in a pub with your mate on Zoom in Canada. That's what it is. Wonderful, but it's not the church. And so we want to deconstruct and pretend we don't need leaders. No, we do need leaders. And even if sometimes I have found, you know, I have found myself it's sometimes easier to talk about leadership in general and say how would Christian leadership in general, which is a very bad thing to talk about, then we don't talk about the value and the beauty of leading in a local church and the significance of it. I want to say again, the church is desperate for leaders. Paul and myself, Paul and as well have gone going to a number of different churches, Michelle as well going with me here in Spain and in South Africa. Every country, every place I've been to, and people I know going to, there's this one thing the church needs leaders. We need to raise up new leaders. If God is doing something, if He is moving in our midst, and it seems to prophetic voices and to many people who are who are seeking these kinds of things, that there is a rustling in the Trees, the balsam tree. It's a rustling that God is doing something. We need leaders for secure, safe, thriving, fruitful churches. So, in light of that, what we are going to be doing is, a, is some significant leadership training during this year. And um, on Tuesday evening, the 14th of March at 7:30, we're 
when we have our normal, our, our, our monthly Kingsgate Kingston leaders training, I want to open that up to anybody in the life of Kingsgate Kingston who is interested about leadership, curious as to what it might be, in any way, I would like to invite you to that space. As we talk, and as I talk a little bit more about leadership and what we're going to be doing regarding leadership training this year. So this is an invitation to all of you, anyone who's interested about leadership, even if you discount yourself, don't let that be the measure of whether you should come along. We're not always the best gauges of that. Come along and see what we're doing about leadership. And see what God says to you. So Acts chapter 14 is a wonderful and exciting chapter. With many incredible things happening. But it strikes me that every single word Paul spoke, all the miracles that he did, everything that took place would have absolutely been wasted if it hadn't been cemented, embedded, and nurtured in those local churches that grew up in those cities, in Derb, in Iconia, and in Lassen. With all their imperfections, all their flaws, and their beauty, these community of Jesus followers filled with the power of God, cemented and grew their story of the gospel. There is power and wonder in the local church.